Can you heal from abuse? What do I do after leaving my narcissist? What does a healthy relationship look like? These concerns cross the minds of over 20 people every minute, over 28,800 people every day. And the sad fact is, we still don't talk about it enough. Healing from emotional abuse isn't a band-aid situation, but it doesn't have to take years either. The lives of millions of other survivors around the world have been impacted by their narcissist. Yours doesn't have to. To show you how to live a free, confident, and peaceful life, your host and founder of the Healing from Emotional Abuse philosophy, Marissa F. Cohen. Hey everyone, welcome back to Breaking Through Our Silence. This is part two of my conversation with Mike Solari, writer, director, producer, and movie expert. With Mike's insight, we were able to pick apart a bunch of movies with depicted sexual assault and discuss the necessity of those scenes in relation to the themes of the films. If you haven't heard part one yet, go check it out on YouTube, iHeartRadio, Spotify, basically any platform that hosts podcasts. In this episode of Breaking Through Our Silence, we dive a little deeper into the world of cinema. And just a heads up, some of these depictions of sexual assault may be graphic and potentially triggering, and there will definitely be movie spoilers. I think that rape and sexual assault and domestic violence have been used as slapstick comedy for a really long time because it was not something that was really, um, un wasn't really questioned, you know? Every time somebody came forward about domestic violence through the late 90s, the police would show up, they'd tell the guy to go take a walk, or I'm sorry, they'd tell the abuser to go take a walk around the block, and they'd tell the victim, what did you do to piss that person off? And that's how it was handled. It, it wasn't handled. That's the problem. Yeah, no, and you see that. You see that in the first season of Veronica Mars, and it kind of carries into the second season of Veronica Mars, it is about a rape. Um, and she goes to the police to report it. Who, and his response is, you know, I think you should go see the wizard and ask him for some guts um, or something like that. It's, it's, I, don't, I forget what he, asked, she's, he tells her to ask for. Because that still happens today in real life, but also, I don't know if you've seen the Netflix show, Unbelievable. Yeah, I loved it. Okay, so awesome. Unbelievable is based on true stories. Um, it is about several people who have been sexually assaulted or raped in various places around the, I think they're around the country or around Colorado, I forget. Um, and with the first case specifically, she goes to the police right away. She makes her report. They ask her the same question 55 times. And then they find one small detail that she mixed up because it's really easy for us to forget the exact order of things. Who she called first was the specific detail. And then they get her on that, convince her that what happened didn't happen or make her believe that they're never going to help her. So she just admits defeat, says it was a lie, and it truly really wasn't, and then she gets ostracized for it. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm hoping becomes more common. Just like you were saying before, how okay. we have to see the uncomfortable stuff in order to really feel it and understand it and take the severity of it to heart. If we don't see it, like they were doing it off screen or, um, you know, they do just sound bites and it's a black screen or whatever, it, it takes the power and the uncomfortable, the discomfort away from us. And it makes it easy to excuse. So even in the show 13 Reasons Why, which I, I know you've seen, when that show was released, the uh, National Suicide Hotline said that their phone calls blew up 40 times. So 40 times the normal number of calls were made to the hotline, which is phenomenal and also awful because you don't know if those same people were already suicidal or if it was something that they felt glorified suicide. We just, the statistics were never conclusive. One thing I did really appreciate, I watched a little bit of the second season and it really, to me, felt like it was trying to bank too much on the Me Too movement, which pissed me off a lot. Um, but I really appreciated the cinematography of the rape scene because it's so, you just, it just, oh God, the close up of her face and you just see her, the life leave her eyes. Yeah. You just see everything, the humanity just fall out of her. And it lingers like 10 seconds too long. And they did that on purpose so that you could truly see the dehumanization of a person when they're being raped. 
I'm going to move away from movies for a second to just mention a book that I've recently finished and I recommend to you and your readers. And it's covering a lot of topics here. And what it's called is Talking to Strangers. It's a Malcolm Gladwell book. The thesis of the book is we as a society do not know how to talk to strangers. We do something called defaulting to truth, meaning that we, as soon as somebody says something to us, even if we don't haven't met them before, our inclination is to believe that person. And the reason we have, and everything I'm going to say is because if we don't, society can't function. That's how society functions is because of a default to truth. If everybody is super suspicious of every single person, we can't trust anybody. Society can't function. The whole premise of the book is we don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to make decisions regarding each other. We don't really know how to read people. And because of that, problems arise. You can't tell comfortability. Or if you are, you're also not sure about it. You look at people who really have made these like apologies and stuff like that. You look at like in real life and you can find the difference between the people we like and the people we don't like. Dan Harmon comes to mind where Megan Gans accused him of just, it was the same thing I mentioned before. He was always asking her out. She was, he was her boss. She was afraid to do, to do certain things. It was, there was this sexual harassment thing. She called him out on it and it became a whole thing. I would highly recommend everyone to listen to, it's a master class of apologizing how he did it on his podcast, talking about the situation. And that's why Rick and Morty, he's still doing Rick and Morty and able to still do stuff and have his show harm and doubt. All right, we're talking about abuse and all that stuff. We have to hit the main ones. So there's two movies I think we hit with, that we haven't talked about and that we got to talk about. First is The Last Tango in Paris. Marlon Brando, uh, there's that, the infamous scene where he rapes her with butter. She talks about how that has affected her as, an, like, as a person, the actress. Last Tango in Paris, though, was a movie that was highly revered. People still talk about how much that movie influences them. Now, this girl was traumatized by this. She was 19 years old. They didn't have it in the script. She showed up on the day. They said, this scene, he's going to rape you and use butter as lubricant. And, uh, and it's obviously not really happening, but she was crying. Like The tears you see in the movie are her real tears. Um, and Bertolucci and Brando defended themselves throughout the years and it's become contentious. And I, I think that's why Blast Tango in Paris doesn't come up in the conversation of great cinema anymore, which is fine. You know, there's movies that we can revere at a time and then we could say, you know what, we're done with that one and we can move on. It can still exist and we can watch it for posterity, but we, we don't always have to revere something just because it was revered in the past. Um, and I think we're learning that more and more. And that's something that w it took a while for people to treat women a diff the, uh, a s closer to the right way. Movies we have to talk about. So Last Tango in Paris, I mean, it's a brutal thing and we didn't see it as brutal in the time. On the flip side, there's a movie that we do see as brutal and it was seen as brutal at the time. And that's The Last House on the Left, which is Wes Craven's first movie. I just watched it for the first time a couple months ago. And I've been putting it off for a while. I, I, I knew what it was about. They remade it recently, not as aggressive. And I mean, it's a staple in horror cinema. It's when you watch it, you, I can see the moments of Wes Craven's talent. Like you can see his talent in there. And the premise of the movie is these two girls are going to a concert in the city. They get, they meet this guy. He's like, okay, come on, we'll hang out and stuff like that. The, him and his family are actually escaped convicts. And they torture them. They keep them hostage. They rape one of the girl. It's very brutal. And this one girl di like dies walk just walking into a water, kind of like defeated. It feels very like Ophelia moment. And she's dead. And it's brutal, like watching it. And to a point, like you could say it's gratuitous. And early Wes Craven movies did that. And there are movies that put rape in their movies that I don't think they need to. A uh, recent one that comes to mind is Don't Breathe. But Last House on the Left, I think, needs it in there because it goes back to that brutality thing. It shows these are the most debased people ever. And there's a reason people watch that. There's something wired in us that kind of is okay with violence. And maybe that's because of society has told us it's okay with violence. PG-13 movies without blood are okay, but not a little sex. There's a great movie documentary called uh, This Film Is Not Yet Rated, which is about 
the MPAA, Motion Picture Association of America, the people who rate movies. And they talk about like, oh, there are two similar things in two different movies. One gets PG-13, one gets R. And a lot of times it has to do with sexual orientation. Gay stuff ends up being R. Hetero stuff ends up being uh, PG-13. Again, a lot of this changes. There's um, violence to different extents. A lot of the things that you say are based on perspective, but also, you know, based from your, from your experience. And that's totally okay. I actually just want to shift gears just a tad and go over to pedophilia because for some reason, while you were talking, what popped into my head was um, American Beauty. And I don't, I'm not a Kevin Spacey fan anymore. I'm actually quite devastated at like the destruction he caused. Um, because I was a big Kevin Spacey fan and then found out he's a pedophile in real life. And Anthony Rapp is one of my favorite Broadway actors. So I have a real... You're a big Broadway girl. Big Broadway girl. And so for for him to have hurt somebody who I have never met and have so much love for and hurt anyone in general, to rape somebody and assault somebody in general. Like, but specifically Anthony Rapp. Specifically Anthony Rapp. It makes him such a horrible human being. But American Beauty growing up was one of my favorite movies. I just thought like it was so creative. And looking back, I'm like, no, no, this is an adult male, 40 something, 50 something, that has this an over-sexualized infatuation with a 15 year old. Now, in some states like Mississippi, that's actually okay because the age of consent is 14. But in most states, I think pretty much every state but Mississippi, that's so not okay, and that is so wrong. So I just kind of want to focus on that for a minute and see if you could think of any other movies or examples of movies that have that kind of theme where they okay and almost glorify pedophilia. Well, I will in a sense. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll get you there in a second. I'm, I don't know if there's a lot of stuff that really glorifies it. I think we looked at things in different ways. First off, you got to remember where we come from. Uh, we were okay with Elvis Presley marrying, how old was she? Like 14, 15? I think. 13. When, uh, yeah. So, uh, and I mean, you see it for forever. I mean, look at the professional, Natalie Portman and uh uh Jean Renault are like fantastic in it and it's about the relationship between a grown man and a young girl now he sees it more as a father daughter relationship and she obviously tries to see it as a flip it around and you can kind of in, like look at that relationship and say how is that not related to uh his own relationship with Ma Wen who is this french model but she was really young when she was dating Luke Besson. And I know people have had conversations about like, well, why does Drake need to be friends with Millie Bobby Brown? Like that doesn't, that seems weird. Like just because they're both actors or famous or something. And we, again, default the truth and we want to hope people are the best that they are. And we're all just trying to pick each other up and we meet cool people. I mean, look, I work in the uh, entertainment industry. I'm a talent manager. I have people, I have clients. I've worked with clients who are kids. I've worked with clients who are old and, uh, I would call some of them friends and it is, is it weird that I have like an AT? It's someone I work with. So it's, it becomes complicated in this kind of industry because of, well, I do work with them, but at the same time they are kids. And then it's like, what are we saying work is? And I don't know. It becomes complicated. Um, I think it's, you look at it by a case by case basis. You want to look at movies. I mean, Manhattan was always one that always put me a little off. The premise of the movie is Woody Allen is dating this really young girl. And, uh, uh his real, name. you know, wasn't it his stepdaughter or not stepdaughter, his adopted daughter, foster daughter. Yeah. And, but it's also not glorified. It's not meant to be a good thing. People call him out on it, but it's seen as like a funny movie. Like people praise this movie and stuff like that. The movie charms us. And in the world of the movie, we're there. And I, I haven't seen Manhattan in a very long time. I believe it's not used. To, they don't say like, this is a good thing. I think people really do call him out on it. I'm trying to think of other, there's definitely tons of movies where young girls have been sexualized and stuff, but you're talking about pedophilia. I mean, movies that really do explore it in interesting ways. I mean, there's little children, which is a fa well, oh, great movie. There's um, mysterious skin, 
which is about how two people have coped with being sexually abused as children by their baseball coach. There's also the uh, Mystic River plays on the idea of dealing with a pedophile and stuff like that. And how does it affect you? I, here's the thing, like a lot, a lot of the examples I'm coming up with, they don't say this is a good thing. And to an extent, American Beauty doesn't say it's a good thing. I just um, do a really beautiful job of creating a very positive character arch for Kevin Spacey's character. He goes from being this miserable, like horrible dad, totally removed, piece of crap human being, to then he just sees this girl in a skimpy outfit as a cheerleader at 15 or 16 years old, and his whole world changes. He starts being happier and sticking up for himself. He, you know, quits his job and goes, you know, starts working out. And you like start Well, okay, so this is something about American Beauty, which again, I think further along will, will change. I mean, the 90s, and you probably remember this, were such a different time. Like everything was so good. And also, it's a pre-9-11 movie. And it's weird when you see pre-9-11 movies and you look at people's problems. And it's like, our problem was we were too bored with our lives. Look at Fight Club. Look at American Beauty. I mean, Revolutionary Road, which is kind of a sequel to American Beauty and uh, spiritually in my mind, because they're both directed by Sam Mendes and Mendes, And they, uh, they both are explaining like the boringness of suburbia and how it kills us. Little Children does the same thing. And I don't think that they're saying that he's, a, I don't even think they're saying in American Beauty that Lester Burnham is a bad dad. He is a person that is now bored with his station in life. He's in the suburbs. He did everything he was supposed to. And then, yes, he gets an injection of maybe I need to start living my life and ha has this midlife crisis thing uh, where he starts smoking weed and working out and doing all this stuff and working at Burger King and stuff like that. And he knows his wife is having an affair and like he's, cause he has to be, and that's part of the thing that pushes him. And what's one of the most midlife crisis things you date a younger woman or something like that. Now what's, I, we, I know you see, she just made like a very big grimace face, everyone, just so you know, but, um, that was something seen as stereoty stereotypical thing in the 90s when some guy would go through a midlife crisis. They'd buy a, a motorcycle or a hot rod or like or Corvette. They would uh, go on some vacation. They would maybe have an affair with a younger woman. Like it's been seen in so many movies. It's really cliche. And that's what American Beauty kind of plays on. And then what is to make that even worse? And that's why he stops when he has the moment to have sex. He and then right before he dies, he has that content moment where he's looking at the photo of his family and he realizes, you know, I had it kind of all along. Again, I haven't seen it in a while. And this is where you and me differ. Like I can kind of, I can separate art from the person. It's difficult sometimes because you say like, oh, well, this came from this person's mind. Yet this mind is also that. And what I've noticed from people is that people are complicated and people have different layers to themselves. It's an onion. It really isn't just one thing. Kevin Spacey can be a good actor and also be a biggest piece of shit ever. And we, I can still say he's a good actor. Um, Woody Allen has written some of the best screenplays of all time um, and has been a shitty person. Uh, Louis C.K. is gross, but... <laughs> hilarious is a great comedy special. I'm going to definitely comment on the Louis C.K. thing because I went and saw him at Madison Square Garden before the accusations came out and I remember him making a joke about masturbating in front of his assistants and his employees and it was so it was so gross that it was funny because of the way that he said it, you know, the way he worded exactly. it. Exactly. It's meant as a matter of fact thing to play on our ideas of society and hold a mirror to it in a weird way. Obviously he was commenting on real things, but when you're not looking at it in a context, it plays differently. But that to me like rang differently because he knew he was doing something wrong and disgusting and made a big joke about it. So not only was he doing the bad thing, but then he was mortifying the people he was actually doing bad things to No hear him. Um, I think to say he, I remember he like waited a year after that to come out and start doing comedy again after a big apology. And I'm still kind of conflicted about it. Um, I do think that his comedy is good. I just, like you said, I have a difficult time differentiating the person from the No, comedy. I know. And there's some episodes of Louie that are just out of this world. Fantastic. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, you have to check out www.marissafaycohen.com backslash private dash coaching. That's www.marissafaycohen.com backslash private dash coaching. Marissa would love to develop a made for you healing plan to heal from emotional abuse. She does all the work and you just show up. Stop feeling stuck, alone, and hurt and live a free, confident, and peaceful life. Don't forget to subscribe to the Healing from Emotional Abuse podcast and follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash Marissa F. Cohen and Instagram at marissa.fay.cohen. We'd love to see you there.